and welcome to the EdTech Chat and Chew podcast, the podcast where four passionate teachers from different parts of the country get together on their lunch breaks to share resources, tips, and ideas to help you empower your students. Each week, we'll do our best to inform and inspire you with the amazing things that are happening in our schools. We're very happy that you've joined us today. And now, here's your host, Diane Smokorowski. Hi, everybody. This is EdTech Chat and Chew, episode number 15, if I'm right. Am I right, Mike? Yeah, 15 or 16. We're somewhere. Okay. <laughs> we're in episode 16. Actually, I think we are 16 now. That's hey, about we, we've made it to the point where we've lost count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're still here. <laughs> so we're going to call this uh, 15.5. And then we'll kind of go with it from that direction. But we're excited to have you join us today. And our topic today is going to be on global collaboration. How do you find those project partners to connect with? And, you know, that's a question that uh, Mike and I get asked a lot of, like, well, how do you talk to national parks and how do you find these other places to do mystery Skypes and so forth? So that's kind of our topic for the day. And, uh, Karen, today is your first mystery animal Skype. So what are some things that you're thinking about? Well, let's see. Okay, first off, we're, we're leaving the country here. No, we're, <laughs> we're connecting across the, well, with Canada, and so to me it's really exciting. I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm just really excited to see how the kids react to it and uh, how much fun they have. And this is the first time for them that they're going to be doing a, an, an interactive um, Skype. I mean, they've had video conferences where they kind of sit and get, but this is the first time they actually get to ask questions and try to solve a, a mystery. And so, I don't know, I'm, I'm excited about it. But I, I kind of wonder this. I'm so inspired by Mike and, and your posts on Facebook every single day. I read them, and, uh, and I'm hearing about how you're connecting with, you know, Africa. You're connecting, you know, across the globe and multiple classes a day, and I'm just in awe, and I, I want to do that. So I I want to know how do you find your connections, make your connections, connect classes, because um, I, I want to do it too. I think that's, that's a legitimate <laughs> question, and I'm excited you want to join us, because as I, I I believe that once you dip your toe in this little world of you know connecting with the world, one time you're like, okay, I need I need to get the the floaties. I'm diving in. You know, <laughs> you need more of it. Yeah, you that's gonna happen today. I'm gonna dip my toe in, and then I'm gonna jump. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike, I'm going to pass it to you. How do you start your connections? So really, uh, two, two different ways that I can think of, um, in addition to some different sites and resources that we, that we can give later. Um, but the two more personal ways without, uh, that aren't necessarily website-based. Uh, number one, through my professional learning network, um, through the people I'm connected with on uh, Skype or uh, on Facebook or Twitter uh, for the most part. And um, you know, if I need someone to talk to my kids about weather, I reach out to that network and I say, "Hey, does anyone have a great meteorologist that they can, you know, connect my class with?" And and usually I'll find someone that way. Um, the the other way, which which I would encourage people to do, is just to um, think to yourself, you know, if my kids are studying this topic, national parks, landforms, weather, whatever it happens to be, animals, think to yourself, who is the absolute coolest person that I could connect them with that could talk to my class? And then contact that person, <laughs> and or have your kids contact that person. And more times than not, the person's going to say yes. And that's um, we, we've actually been working with um, a guy by the name of Dr. Dean Hines, who works for the Space Science Telescope Institute. And um, he didn't was not connected to anyone in my network, and um, you know I didn't know him at all. But uh, he looked like a really cool guy and had a great backstory. And uh, my kids were interested in astronomy, so I sent him an email and said, Hey, I've got these fifth graders who are really interested in astronomy and uh, would love to know about your work on the Hubble Space Telescope, and could you give us, you know, a half hour sometime? And he said yes, and we set up an amazing call uh, where we talked to him. He he had a great slideshow, showed different pictures of infrared images and how the uh, Hubble Space Telescope is different than the James Webb, Webb Telescope that's going to be going up into space. And uh, now, uh, through that interaction, I have him connected with, um, he's going to talk to our calculus kids about how um, his study of the comet Ison used calculus in order to, to track the path of that comet. So, um, yeah, just identify people who would be really awesome and reach out to them. That's awesome. Okay, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so as far as, like, I mean, reaching out and you find that person, does it take a lot to come up with, I mean, do you just have them share their expertise and have kids um, in advance come up with questions, or is it kind of like an, an improv kind of thing? Do you want to answer that, Diane, or do you want me to keep going? Um, well, I can take a little bit of that. I say both, actually. Um, and I like what Mike said. You know, you definitely want to try to connect 
what the content in the classroom is to the person you're connecting with. That's where it makes it, those real world connections begin. So, for example, um, I was working with a teacher in Western Kansas this last week, and her students are studying the Little House on the Prairie Park. It's an elementary teacher, and I said, "Well, you know, let's stop and think about it. Who might be an expert on somebody with Laura Ingalls Wilder?" And they said, "Well, maybe there's a museum." I said, "That's exactly where I would start wow. as well." And I said, "Let's go into Google and see what museums are out there." Well, there's a couple of them, and lo and behold, every museum that's substantially, you know, has enough staff, generally has an education docent through that, to that grouping. And I said, well, you see this? There's the person, and then there's an email, and there's a phone number. So I start with the phone number. I think that definitely um, has a tendency for them to not say no a little easier <laughs> when, you, when you make a phone call. But if you write the right persuasive description of what it is that you want, like Mike did, then people are real interested in it to say, you know, this is a service that you can give back to students. Um, but I do tell students if we're going to talk to an expert, the questions that you need to ask are things that we can't find in a Google search. You know, I mean, because there's no point in us calling somebody if you're going to be like, well, when was Laura Ingalls born? Well, the, the Wikipedia gets right to that sort of a thing. So you want to talk more about the things that you're curious of. Like, well, why do you think she was compelled to write these books? Well, that's a great question. That as somebody who's as passionate about Laura Ingalls Wilder as the students are curious, you made the perfect fit. So I tell the students um, that we need to come up with at least three really good questions before we make the call and start making those connections begin, so that it's not overwhelming. Three questions are most people can handle. You know, it's not too like I have the top ten things I need to figure and figure out. So we go with three, and then I always have another three in the backup for the improv. And then it, things just kind of organically go from there. Would you agree, Mike? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we've started doing along those lines is uh, sometimes we'll, you know, we'll have a background discussion ahead of time, or um, maybe watch a short YouTube video on the topic that we're studying. Um, we just talked with a, a weather balloon scientist from uh, NOAA a couple days ago, and he had sent us a YouTube video of him sending um, a cup of crickets and an angry bird doll into near space on a weather balloon. It was like a five-minute video, so we had the kids watch that ahead of time and then generate the questions that Diane's talking about. And I put them into a Google Doc and actually had them um, projected up next to the screen where our guest speaker couldn't see it, but the kids could. And then as, as when, um, when our speaker was talking, as he answered some of those questions before we got to like a Q&A session, we would eliminate them so that kids would, you know, or, or put the answer up next to them so that kids would know, hey, we've got that one answered. Here's the information that we wanted to know. We've got it. Here are the things we still want to know um, going forward. So yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. And I, and I like what Diane was saying about connecting it with the content. I think that's so important. Um, it's really cool to talk to people all over the world. And you can do it, and kids will be interested, even if it doesn't fit your content. But it's like a exponential super bonus if you can um, use those guest speakers to get kids excited about the content you want to teach anyway. And so I think, I think global collaboration fits in really well with problem and project-based learning. Because if you have kids that are trying to solve a real world problem or, or trying to solve a really interesting, you know, come up with a solution to a, a really awesome project, um, and then you bring in someone that has information that they need for that project or that problem, um, you know, they're, they're dying to know the information that that person has. And it makes that emotional connection that allows them to learn and, and transfer that information to their long term memories. Agreed, definitely. And some of the things like the mystery Skypes and the mystery animals you're going to experience today are great. Um, <laughs> well, we've, we've called it kind of like the gateway <laughs> some better, better spaces. But I think it's just a great practice space for students to get to learn how to communicate using video conferencing. It's non-threatening. Um, in the little kid world, mystery animals and mystery numbers are a great place. Like, guess what number I'm thinking of, you know? And you just play 20 questions to guess where the other number might be, or the mystery location, or whatever that that focus might be. But you know, the speaking and listening skills are something that we're all assessing, whether we're a common core state or not. That is something that everybody is investigating these days a little more um, effectively because things like video conferencing are going to be fluid in all realms of, of industry. So it makes sense for students to practice those. Um, but when you get into you know, exploring what are the other opportunities your students could do, then you have something like Mike's putting together for Monday. Now explain this adventure, Mike. Yeah. So 
Um, we've we've contacted um, or you know had uh, collaborations with the Cherry Education Center in Cairo, Kenya, a couple times this year, and we've done a couple of musical musical exchanges where uh, certain groups of our students have sung our favorite songs for them. Like around St. Patrick's Day, we had our second graders sing St. Patrick's Day songs and and explain to the kids in Kenya how we celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Um, and then the, the children in Kenya would sing us some of their favorite songs in either English or Swahili and explain the history behind that. So we had such a good time doing that and, and got so much out of it that um, our fourth grade chorus is putting together a fundraiser concert with their favorite songs from Frozen, um, which they're really excited to sing. And I said, wouldn't it be neat if we were able to share some of our favorite songs with them, again, since they're different songs than we had, than we had used before. Um, and so I contacted Cherry, and they were very interested in doing it again. Um, and I asked... Um, their teacher, Livingston, there, if um, he would be open to me trying to bring in some different locations so we could have like a kind of a musical exchange, cultural exchange on a, on a larger scale. And of course he was open to it. Um, so we have a school in um, Barcelona, Venezuela, um, in South America. We have uh, Jed Derryberry's class in South Carolina. And Jed is just an absolute rock star teacher who has a piano in his classroom and does some amazing things. So his kids are going to participate. Um, our fourth grade chorus and um, the children in Kenya. And we're going to take turns singing our favorite songs and, and sharing a little bit about um, culturally where those songs come from and why we enjoy them. So um, it's, it's going to be a pretty awesome experience. And don't forget, kids can be experts too. That's what's great about his project for Monday is kids, you know, my kids live in the prairie. And Karen, your students live in the southwest and Mike's up in the deciduous forest. So. <laughs> <laughs> of uh, Pennsylvania, so... We, we, can, we can call it the booties, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we each have a different walk of life, we have a different regional foods, you know, all of these things are what make us unique where we live, so let this be an exchange all the way around. Yeah, and we, had, we had a call the other day, um, I've got a group of fourth grade students who are very interested in um, stopping child labor around the world, and so it just so happened through a contact on Twitter, we ended up um, in contact with a teacher and a sixth grade student in India who have been working on that same project uh, from an Indian point of view in India um, recently. And we had a collaboration with them and half of our fourth grade class was really into it and the other half had kind of, you know, gotten to that point where they've been doing this, they've been studying this problem for a month now and maybe it's not as relevant to them uh, either. And um, my fourth grade teacher came to me afterwards and we had the conversation about, you know, for those other kids, was it still a worthwhile experience? And, you know, what she said was, was pretty powerful. She said, we're here in northeastern Pennsylvania with, there's not a whole lot of diversity. Some of these kids will never leave this small area or, you know, will leave very infrequently. And if nothing else, those kids had the experience of talking to someone with an Indian accent. And that is an experience that they may never again have in their, in their lives. So, you know, just, just putting kids in contact with other cultures and having experiences that they couldn't otherwise have, that 10 years ago they couldn't have because this technology didn't exist is enormously powerful. Yep. Skype's only been around since 2006 and I don't think I even used video with it until late 2007 and it was sketchy because nobody had the wireless to handle the video. Yeah. So I mean you stop and think about it, just seven, seven years of the possibilities and now it's it's becoming more and more mainstream in more schools. I, I'm finding more schools are opening it up than closing it. Would you guys both agree to that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Both of the teachers that I talked to this morning just had it unblocked uh, in the last month. So I think I think it's becoming more and more prevalent. It just it makes sense to me. I mean, I think kids need to be connecting anyway, but now it's easy. <laughs> we have tools <laughs> like this to do that. So well, I can think, I, Go ahead, Karen. I was going to say, I think if uh, you are in a district in which Skype is blocked, I would pull up Skype in the classroom because that's how I found my mystery Skype anyway. I thought, you know, Diane's been talking about it, Mike's been talking about it, let me see what's out there. And when I did stumble upon the, upon the uh, animal mystery Skype, I, I knew our first graders were working with uh, um, animal, um, basically observing animals right now, so I knew that was the perfect one. But if you, sh if you, if you were able to show them what's there and the connections that you can make, and how it's valuable in the classroom, I think it would be a good, I mean, maybe they don't know it exists, maybe they don't know teachers are connecting their classrooms there and all of the curricular connections they can make with other schools across the, the world, right, beyond our country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, and I, I definitely think we should talk about that Skype in the Classroom website, but I want to I share a little anecdote from this morning that I think ties right into what Karen was saying. 
So I'm um, talking with Jed Derryberry in his second grade class, who's singing for us, and we're doing the animal Skype and all that. And um, I've got um, Sue Levine from, uh, from Atlanta on the other line. And uh, Jed's principal happens to walk into the room, right? Um, now, they just have Skype has been unblocked for less than a week for them. It just got opened up. So the principal walks in the room and says, hey, what are you guys doing in here? What's all this commotion going on? <laughs> so Jed says to me, hey, Mike, will you explain to the principal you know, what, we're, you know, what we're doing on Monday? So I explain about the musical exchange that his kids are going to um, be taking part in. And like the woman's jaw almost hit the floor. <laughs> and she's like, how come we haven't been doing this longer? Like, the, you know, what do you mean it's only been blocked up until a week? You know? So I do think once, once administrators and teachers see the possibilities and see the incredible learning experiences that kids can have, it's going to get, I mean, you know, it should be unblocked for, um, you know, for everyone. Mm -hmm. But Diane, why don't you talk a little more about that Skype and the educate, uh, Education Skype website. Because you bet. That's, I'm gonna that's actually, awesome. I'm gonna actually going to do a screen share if I can. Yeah. And hopefully you can see the Skype website, yes? Yeah. Okay. So is it still there? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Just making sure. I, I didn't do the whole desktop, so I just want to make sure I was sharing the right, uh, the right pieces. And it's a little fussy in here. So with the screen share, uh, we're just going to switch that real quickly. I'm sorry. We're just going to go desktop. Sometimes it's just the easy button for me, <laughs> so we we'll go there. Okay, so let's minimize you guys for a moment. All right, so Skype in the classroom. It is probably, and you guys can still see it, right? Yeah. No. yeah. Okay, sometimes oh. when I go full yes, screen, it loses it. Okay, so it's divided up into four basic areas. Skype lessons, teachers, guest speakers, and collections. And I should tell you the website is education.skype.com. And what I really like to start with are the guest speakers. These are experts who can talk to your classes about their personal passions. And they have one that's just shown up recently on how to find a dinosaur. Museums are stuffed with beautiful skeletons of extinct animals, but how do paleontologists know what, where to look for these? So you click on any one of these components, and you can see a little bit more about the lesson, what this person will be talking about and so forth. This is a person in the United States and so at least you know about the time zones but what a great experience if you have students studying fossils is this not the most perfect person for your kids to talk to? I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> and this one is new too and I was talking to uh, Mike about this one just the other day. Did you, fav did you join this one? No, um, I talked to our teachers that are that's, that use Roald Dahl in their classroom, and they're swamped with CDT testing here, so, mm -hmm. we, couldn't, so we couldn't take advantage. This, if anybody has students who are reading Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, this is the same author. Well, you actually get to tour the Roald Dahl Museum in England, and they're having a special one day only on Monday, June second and dug on it we'll be out of school here in Kansas so we aren't eligible to be a part of this one but an awesome opportunity for your students to connect with people who are passionate about the author as well and you can just keep scrolling down through here and see what other options are available there's just hundreds of them yeah then, and Diane, you can yes. um, in addition to just scrolling through you can also use the search bar to look for the topic that you're that true you're in. true so let's say that I'm looking for dolphins and then it pulls up with people who are experts on dolphins to work with your students. So how easy is that, Karen? Uh, it's easy. That's, I was so shocked at by how easy it was when I went on there a couple weeks ago. I thought, I'm just going to start looking at our curriculum and shoot these, uh, <laughs> shoot these opportunities out. Like that Roll Doll one, I already know the perfect third grade teacher to share that with. <laughs> That's awesome. And, I have to say, I work with nine schools, and so sometimes I feel like I'm going crazy all over the place. But what I did with that animal Skype was I picked six teachers that might say yes, and I emailed them, thinking, you know, I'm either going to get six replies yes, and I can help if I need to, or get none, or get one. And um, so I, I'm going to just start doing that, shooting them out, and I got, I got a teacher that said yes. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm even happier, I think, just I, <laughs> I'm going to start searching uh, Skype. It's going to have to be like with my morning coffee, I think. Yeah, I, I stock this website pretty much. <laughs> I will tell you. Um, yeah, and that just... that's, that's one thing that I've learned um, as I've gotten more used to the job that I'm doing this year. Um, in the beginning of the year, I was trying to have teachers come to me with their content so that I could help them find really cool experiences. Mm -hmm. But what I've discovered is if I do the research on their content ahead of time, 
and then identify the experiences before I even talk to them, and then go to them and say, like, hey, I know you're reading Roald Dahl. How would you like to go tour the Roald Dahl Museum? More often than not, I'm going to get a yes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And the classroom collections, these are some of the partnerships that um, Skype has created, virtual field trips with people who have worked with the Iditarod, several oceans components. They have a partnership with the Jacques Cousteau Foundation, um, things with space and so forth. But another component I think teachers need to know is this teacher's section, um, where you can, actually I'm going to jump over to Skype lessons for a moment, and choose the mystery Skype link. Mm -hmm. This actually takes you to places where other people are using Mystery Skypes and all of the teachers in their profiles who said, hey, I, I'd be game to do one of these adventures. You can actually look by location. So if I want to talk to an Australian or let's, an Austrian classroom, let's go see what's in Austria. And hopefully there's one that popped up. Not so much. Okay, so let's go look in Australia. Oh, I guess Austria did show up. I'm sorry. They moved him right over yeah, here. Right, probably, yeah. mm -hmm. So here it is with grade levels. Those who are on Twitter, so you can even contact them on Twitter or by email and say, hey, my students, especially if you had a high school German class mm -hmm. who were studying um, things in German, and here's an international school, which are always fantastic because they have multiple languages. You can right. connect with anywhere in the world. So that's just kind of the basics and taking at the lessons. These are the most recent projects that are out there for people to join. So yeah, that's it. I, I just can't believe how easy it is. I, I'm in awe. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it? That's all you have to yeah. do? That's and, and you know, okay, so I was having a little anxiety about um, asking, you know, trying to get this mystery Skype. Well, like, when will we plan it out? How long, you know, how long does she need before it happens? And I sent her a message, and that day she messaged back, sure, we could do it this week, we could do it next week. These are, you know, this is our time zone. You let me know when's a good time for the class. And so it was, it was so quick. And I, I, again, so shocked at, at how easy it was. <laughs> yeah. That's now it. I have I have a um, a document that I can put in our show notes page um, that I give to our teachers that kind of has the guidelines for a mystery Skype, and it's more based for oh. a geography mystery Skype, but um, it can be adapted to anything. Um, we we break up our class in so that uh so that there's a couple of different roles. Every kid has a different role, and we kind of rotate that around over the course of the year. So we'll have a couple of kids that are on Google Earth and um, on Google. So if we get asked, like, does the does the Allegheny River run through your state? You know, that's out by Pittsburgh, where you know some of our second graders might not be sure. They can use Google Earth to find, you know, where's the Allegheny River? Does it run through Pennsylvania? Um, we also have a group of kids that is in charge of looking at the map to see what's eliminated and developing questions based on what's left. And we have another group that's in charge of marking off the map and determining what states are now eliminated. That the other that the other school has. So um, you know, r reporters that are going around with pic uh, with cameras taking pictures of the experience to put it on our blog. So um, I'm tag teaming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So almost like jigsawing it so that um, every kid has an invested interest because you don't want 25 kids sitting there and only three kids are asking questions. Yeah. And, you know, the other kids have nothing to do. Um, but again, you could adapt that for animals or you know, guess the whatever that you're that you guess the number whatever you're trying to do in your class. And the only the last thing I would recommend, and I'll put a link on our show notes page, is a time zone converter tool so that you know this person is in Austria, this is where you are, and we want to meet on May the May 10th. You can actually create this calendar generator tool that shows what time it is in both locations. Mm -hmm. That saves me a lot of agony a lot of time. Do you use yeah. that something like that, Mike? Yeah, and by the way, um, as a fifth grade teacher, um, you know, I have, time zones have been in our curriculum forever, and uh, they were always very difficult to teach <laughs> up until we started collaborating with people all over the globe. <laughs> then it became suddenly much easier, much more understandable to kids. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, is there any other questions we can answer for you, Karen? Um, I guess not. I, I, again, I'm just so inspired by checking out your, your tweets and Facebook messages, and um, I just want to thank you guys for all you're doing and sharing because it. You know, I, I think when, when you're feeling nervous about it and you see someone else is doing it, it it's, I don't know, I, I, th I can do it too. I'm going to try. And so um, I want our kids to have those same awesome experiences that your students are having. And so I'm going to dive in and, and get our kids there. Awesome. Yeah, okay. yeah and I would, I would encourage anyone, that, you know, any of our listeners or people that are connected with us, if you have questions that Karen didn't ask or, or you know, you're wondering things that Diane and I can answer for you, 
add, send us an email or put it on our Facebook page, and we'll, we're happy to help you get started on your you know global collaboration journey going forward. Yeah, we can't wait to hear your stories. All yeah, right, thank you, you, friends, and we'll see you next time on EdTech Chat and Two. Oh, except we forgot to ask what's for lunch. Oh, that's right. Uh, wait, let me grab my lunch. I had this meeting at 7 o'clock in the morning, and this awesome teacher brought burritos. So I get a chili nice. and a burrito for lunch. Yay! Um, okay, Mike. Nice. I had some uh, leftover gumbo that my wife made that was incredible, and a little piece of salmon that went along with it. Very nice. And it's Teacher Appreciation Week in our district, as it is everywhere else. So we've had a couple of really yummy homemade meals brought in for teachers, but today I came home for lunch, so yep, it's PB&J, friends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, friends, for joining us for this week's EdTech Chat and Chew. We love getting together to learn from each other, and we're happy you were able to learn along with us today. You can make sure that you don't miss an episode by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes or to our YouTube channel. If you enjoy the podcast and you got a few good ideas today, please take a second to leave us a review on iTunes. Leaving a review is a great way to let others know about the show. Show notes and more information about topics from today's episode can be found on our website, edtechchatnchew.weebly.com. If you have questions for us or would like to give us feedback, drop us an email at edtechchatnchew at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and we'll try and get your questions answered on future shows. On behalf of the podcast team, I'd like to wish you a week filled with all of the amazing things that make teaching the greatest job in the world. Make sure to join us next week when we have an EdTech discussion about great things that are happening in our classrooms. See you next time. Until then, keep on learning.